Ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, colleagues, uh, welcome uh, to VU, in particular to those of you who are not uh, studying here or working here. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Lang. I'm a professor for uh, international tax law, but uh, today I'm here in my capacity as vice rector for research and uh, human resources. Yeah, again, very warm welcome uh, to all of you. Um, happy uh, to uh, be here and, uh, and uh, to listen to uh, the debate we are going uh, to hear. Uh, yeah, I think the topic, I don't have to introduce the topic, this will be uh, done uh, by uh, my colleague, uh, by our moderator, uh, by Raya Mutarak. And uh, yeah, she is an associate professor in geography and international development at the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia in the UK and she's very uh, closely connected uh, with Vienna uh, at uh, our, uh, she's uh, active at the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital, which is based here in Vienna and also uh, active at YASA and we have uh, close uh, relations uh, with uh, both uh, institutions. Uh, so therefore we are very happy that you're here. I'm also very pleased that again, one of our uh, departments, uh, the Socioeconomics Department uh, is uh, happy to, uh, uh, to organize uh, and to structure the whole event together with our uh, Department of Economics. So it's uh, a kind of uh, joint uh, venture. Yeah, and I think the topic is extremely interesting. And uh, again, warm welcome uh, to all of you. Looking forward uh, to listening uh, to what's uh, going to happen next. And I'm happy to hand over uh, to Raya. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very kind introduction, Professor Lang. Um, actually, I'm quite happy to see that there's so many people interested in disaster research, which in fact, you know, people like us, we're waiting to, for disaster to happen and we can collect data, which is, it's, it's not, not, not such a nice thing to do. Um, yeah, and there are many, many open questions actually, which gonna be, some of them are going to be answered empirically by the talk of Thomas and also Jesus. And I think it's quite unique also to have um, the three of us together today in the sense that we all come from different disciplines. So I'm more um, a sociologist, demographer, and Thomas is a political scientist, Jesus is an economist, and we haven't fought yet, so that's... That's, that's a good sign. Um, maybe by the end of the talk, we don't know. But, but I think the good thing of having, we are interested in disaster research, but of course we can answer it using different um, methods or me methods or we come from different um, kind of interests. So maybe I, I'm, you might be wondering like what kind of, why, why am I here? What, what kind of disaster research I do? So I just quickly introduce my, my own research and then I, I would introduce uh, Jesus and, and Thomas later. So um, my, actually my interest in disaster research started when I moved to Vienna, actually when I joined the Wittgenstein um, Center. So we are interested, and so back in 2011, we are interested to look at the role of education in reducing vulnerability to disaster. So that was quite new thing on the table back then. So, um, so the interest there, it's sort of, because if we talk about investing in education and vulnerability reduction, we're talking about soft adaptation measures, right? As opposed to investing in hard adaptation measures such as seawall or dike, which um, Thomas talk is gonna cover um, this part um, as well. Um, but to to put that on the table, to show to policymakers maybe education matters, we need empirical evidence. And back then that, that started my obsession of kind of whenever disaster strike, I wanted to go there, collect the data. I, ha I have done some of that as well, such as after the Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines back in 2013. So we, we do have, um, we have produced some empirical examples showing that um, individual or household or communities or countries with higher level of education, they do have higher level of disaster preparedness and also um, have lower disaster mortality. So education does matter. So the talk of Jesus 
it's going to cover a little bit also um, the human capital side of uh, natural disasters. So now I lost my, this is my new tablet, so I lost my notes. So let me try to bring it up again because I'll, I would like to start introducing Thomas. Um, okay, so um, as you so Thomas actually he hasn't been um, well recently, but because Thomas thought that VU does matter a lot, so I'm very really happy that you you can make it and and thank thanks for us still coming here. Um, so Thomas is a professor of quantitative social research at the Department of Socioeconomics, and he has a straight profile in political science. So he, he did a diploma, also PhD, and habilitation in political science. So um, Thomas has a so he's a real political scientist, and in particular, Thomas has made oh well, <laughs> you you can you can contest that at least from the profile, not 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 straight, not no straight like me, like I did sociology and a bit of demography, a bit of other stuff. Uh, then, uh, but Thomas has made many contributions, but two things that I would like to highlight. Uh, one is the advancement in quantitative social, um, quantitative method in social science research. And Thomas has produced a lot of important work on that. And, and also, um, obviously the novel research on disasters because in fact I know your work before meeting you personally in, in Vienna because I've been, um, I started later of course my interest in disaster research. I've been following your work on gender gap in life expectancy after um, uh, natural disasters and also conflict. So that has been, whoever wants to, to study natural disaster, definitely you have to cite his work. It's, it's just fundamental part. And um, the talk that Thomas is giving today, so she, it's kind of has a bit of link to my personal life as well, because I have lived and studied in Japan for three years. So I, I kind of know actually everything about um, earthquake preparedness or um, tsunami warning. So it's 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 this. Um, it is what you what what you do. People know about it, and I think Japan is such a good case study for many many reasons, which you're going to cover anyway. But sort of Japan has a lot of experience of of national disaster, and also based on 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 this experience, they also have probably one of the top country in terms of preparing for particularly for earthquakes and tsunami, right? So that's a, that's a kind of question, empirical question that we haven't um, got a solid answer yet. So if you experience natural disaster, probably it's increased awareness and also increased disaster preparedness. That's the likely thing that you would expect. But at the same time, if you have survived a disaster for the first time, you might think as well that I should be fine the second time. So maybe people are not quite ready or prepared. So hence the double-edged sword of disaster. So with this, um, I would like to invite Thomas on the stage. The, the stage is yours now. Thank you. Well, good evening and thanks for coming. Um, I may occasionally cough a little because I'm not perfectly fine, but I try to get away from the microphone if that happens. So to this day, mankind has developed, where's my clicker? Mankind has developed three different explanations for natural disasters. <clears throat> the first one, explains natural disasters as act of God, which pretty much from day one, I wasn't there on day one, in case you wondered, but pretty much from day one, I think, to 1755, this idea dominated mankind's understanding of natural disasters. So what happened in 1755, you may wonder, and the answer is that was the Lisbon earthquake and tsunami. <coughs> I'm sorry. And the earthquake and the tsunami and the fires killed roughly half or a third of the population of uh, Lisbon and destroyed 
large parts of the city. Specifically, it destroyed all churches, but it left the red light district intact. And that seems to be more in line with an explanation that suggests that natural disasters are actually an act of nature. In this perspective, the forces of nature trigger natural disasters. And that, of course, is straightforward. But between 1755 and perhaps 1915, we didn't know why this happened. So we said, OK, these are natural disasters, and therefore it's nature. <coughs> but we didn't understand the causes for earthquakes, the causes for volcanic activities, and we didn't understand tsunamis. This changed in 1915 when Alfred Wegener suggested theory of tectonic plates <clears throat> and continental drift. And as you can see from this slide here, you have red lines, which show you the boundaries, the borders of the, uh, the tectonic plates. And you see yellow and red and orange dots, which indicate uh, earthquakes over, I wanted to say the last 30 days, but I uh, collected this information on the 4th of December. So it's pretty much uh, a week ago that I collected the data, but these are really actual, rather actual earthquakes. And you, everybody who does empirical research will immediately see that the theory uh, hardly ever fitted data any better. So you see uh, earthquake activity directly at the borders of the tectonic plates. However, natural disasters are not just natural. As the World Bank suggested a few years ago in a book titled Natural Hazards and Natural Disasters, that it's that weather a natural hazard becomes a disaster does not only depend on nature, but only on human activities and inactivities, or as the World Bank put it, on omission and commission. So I give you an example here, which is pretty straightforward. In 2010, there were two major earthquakes uh, one took place in Haiti and had a magnitude of 7.0, and it killed roughly 260,000 people. The Haitian government suggests it killed 320,000 people. Other sources suggest that only 200,000 people died. That's a lot for an earthquake of magnitude 7. In the same year in Chile, a much stronger earthquake hit and it had a magnitude of 8.8, .8, and it was the fifth largest, strongest ever measured earthquake, and only 525 people died. Of course, this is down to very different structures, very different locations, but also on very different construction codes in these two countries. So when it comes to explaining not earthquakes, but earthquake mortality, we do have nowadays a mixture of natural science explanations, which you can see here, quake magnitude and the shallowness of the earthquake, the distance from the epicenter. But we also strongly believe in socioeconomic factors and uh, <coughs> political influences on disaster mortality factors, such as population density, poverty, autocratic rule and corruption, and an historical absence of major earthquakes in the area. So the fewer earthquakes you experienced, the higher the death toll of an, of an earthquake, everything else being equal. There is also a strong regularity highlighted by social science disaster research, that is that higher per capita income in the affected area is associated uh, 
with lower mortality and with higher economic damage. So by investing in infrastructure, by investing in uh, construction codes and better buildings, you uh, translate mortality into economic damage. And this holds pretty generally over a wide variation of natural disasters. However, there's an important exception to this rule, and this is when infrastructural safeguards fail, then we get a combination of high mortality and high economic damage. And the, the example that I analyze today, the Tohoku tsunami, is a, a case that explains and highlights this relation and what happens when infrastructures fail and when the earthquake or the tsunami is larger than anticipated by the government. So the economic damage of the Tohoku tsunami is estimated to be roughly $360 billion. And the number of fatalities is around 18,500. There are different figures out there depending on how you count in missing people. So my research question for this presentation and the underlying paper is, why was the death toll of the Toku tsunami so, so high? And of course, the trivial answer is because the earthquake was that strong. And then the more interesting question is, why did the death toll differ so much across Japanese prefectures that were affected by the tsunami? And I will use the answer to the second question to also shed light on the first question. <clears throat> Let me start by very quickly saying that the dominant view in the literature on learning from disaster is rather optimistic. The majority of the published papers suggest that in the worst case, you don't learn from natural disasters, and in the best case, we learn from natural disasters and we adapt better to the hazards. Um, and this presentation today tries to cast some doubt on this simplification and overly optimistic interpretation of uh, natural disaster data that we have. So there are basically three different approaches to reduce disaster mortality, and all of us are free to choose two of them, and only our governments are capable and in charge of improving the third response to, that, to, to natural hazards. Of course, what we all can do is prevent settlement in risky areas. We do not have to live close to a coast, which is close to a fault line, an active fault line, and therefore prone to tsunamis. But of course, that's often impossible and always expensive. And of course, in many cases, it violates individual freedoms if governments regulate uh, whether people are allowed to settle in certain areas. Then, of course, we can all invest privately in disaster mitigation, which tends to be expensive. So the World Bank has estimated that uh, earthquake-proof construction of houses increases the house prices by anything between 10 and 50 percent. So that's, uh, of course, possible to build disaster to earthquake-proof houses, but it's pretty expensive. And then there is this issue that part of the cost of disasters are external and private investors do not internalize the negative externalities of natural disasters. And this brings in the government and public investment in disaster mitigation, which is still expensive. However, it internalizes externalities, at least in democracies, and it solves at least partly the collective action problem that occurs because 
dikes are a weak link problem and if you build a dike and your neighbor doesn't, then your dike doesn't help much. So given that these three different solutions are out there, it's straightforward and easy to see that public solutions dominate, at least in Japan. Japan's modern disaster preparedness policies are actually world-class, world-leading, perhaps matched by what we know from California, but my impression is that the Japanese is a little bit ahead of California. So what they do is they use strict building and construction code, which is regularly updated and strengthened. They have a rigorous drill system that Raya uh, experienced personally. I have not uh, in schools and public and private institutions. They have a sophisticated early warning system, which worked well in the Tohoku tsunami on one hand, and then not so well on the other hand, as we will see in a minute, which relies on sensors and that record seismic activities. And then they have a sophisticated system of earthquake and tsunami resistant shelters, like tsunami towers, which killed quite a few people in the Tohoku tsunami, floodgates and dikes, uh, tsunami walls, and so on and so on. I'll show you a picture in a minute. So given all these policies, given all these public investments in disaster mortality re reduction, what could possibly go wrong? And this is what didn't go wrong. What you see here is the famous Fudai wall, which is the only tsunami wall that just about withstand the Tohoku tsunami. This wall is 15 meters high. All other cities, all other municipalities had tsunami walls which were give or take six meters high. And this wall was just about high enough. So the, the area behind the wall was actually inundated, but nobody died in Fudai. So this is what you should have had to be safe. What most municipalities and cities and villages had was roughly 40% of what you see here. So let me quickly remind you about what happened. So the, Earthquake took place on March 11, 2011. Uh, the local time was early afternoon. The earthquake shook the earth for six minutes and the magnitude was measured slash estimated to be between 9.0 and 9.1, which makes it the fourth strongest measured earthquake of all times. And everything else that matters here I already mentioned. There are a few lesser known effects of this earthquake. It shortened the length of a day by about 1.8 microseconds. Northern Japan moved 2.4 meters closer to the US and it shifted the Earth's axis by up to 25 centimeters. That was a powerful beast. And here is what you should have done. You have a choice between fleeing and not fleeing, and roughly 58%. This is just a survey of three prefectures, so it cannot be generalized to the entire population. But in these three prefectures, 58% of the people flee. And of those fleeing, only about 5% was caught by the water. Of those that did not flee, the 42% that did not flee, roughly half of them were caught by the water. So you should have fled. Why didn't you? <laughs> 
The answer to the why didn't you question, of course you weren't there, but why didn't the Japanese people flee? The answer is complex and in the paper that we have published on this, there are very different <laughs> explanations and, and examples. However, the most obvious and perhaps the strongest influence on the decision to stay was the combination of an early warning and the existence of tsunami walls. So the first early warning suggested that the tsunami would be major, that's the highest category, doesn't sound too dangerous, right? And uh, it would be six meters in Miyagi, three meters in Iwate and Fukushima, and two meters in Ibaraki and Chiba prefectures. Keep in mind that the tsunami wall in those prefectures was six meters high. Then 25 minutes later, when it was too late, the early warning, which then became a late warning, was corrected and, and uh, now suggested that the tsunami wave would be six meters high. Here's what one survivor that stayed behind from Ofunato said, and let me read this. When I first heard the tsunami warning for three meters, I thought that would be all right because the breakwater in our town is higher than that. In reality, the tsunami that hit the three prefectures had a 10 to 15 meter mean inundation height and a 40 meter run-up height. I show you a graph in a minute that explains this. As a result, despite the early tsunami warning, many residents were caught by surprise when the actual tsunami arrived and was much higher than predicted by the Japanese Meteorological Agency. So here are the actual run-up heights for the tsunami for different prefectures. It was 40 meters in pretty much all the prefectures from Ofunato to Miyako. And here in this figure, you see the difference between a tsunami wave. That's basically the height of the tsunami wave on the ocean and the run-up height. That's the height of the water once the tsunami hits land. And there's a difference there. So in the paper, which I kind of present here, uh, the research design uh, uses, uh, I think, relatively innovative approach to actually uh, analyzing the effect of expectations when we don't know what the expectations were and the influence of the decision to flee or not to flee. So we use the moderator approach. And the moderating variable that we have in this research design is actually previous experience with tsunamis. So as I said before, what does not vary is the height of the tsunami walls. Give or take, those walls were six meters high. What did vary across different prefectures was previous experience with tsunamis and with tsunami mortality. So our conjecture is that prefectures in which people have an experience with tsunamis and with tsunami mortality were more likely to flee and therefore had a lower death toll. And as you will expect by now, this is what the data shows. <coughs> so I will very quickly go through uh, the, the research design. It's better if you're interested to send me an email and I send you the paper. So the total number of municipalities in Japan is 1,741. We only used <laughs> those <laughs> municipalities with the run-up high, uh, run higher than one meter. That's 88. 
We also can reduce uh, the number of cases further to, uh, uh, to only include municipalities with a run-up high higher than two meters and 71. That's the lowest run-up that actually caused fatalities. What we have done is so we had all the tsunami information based on geocoded data. So we had to link it to, to prefecture data and we used shape files for this pretty common approach. The variable of interest, the main explanatory variable is the number of death in previous tsunamis and the dependent variable is the number of death in Tohoku tsunami. And then we have uh, socioeconomic control variables and you may not like it that we have included, included high school degree because the effect works in the opposite direction as you want it to be. So here's the regression table and the educational attainment has a positive effect of mortality. So better, at in better educated prefectures on average, better educated prefectures, more people stayed behind and were killed by the tsunami. So what interested us, of course, was the historical tsunami death. And I will show you two pictures to explain the results. This is what we get when we use historical run-up heights, and there is basically no effect. So whether a prefecture previously had experienced a tsunami of a certain high does not reduce mortality in the Tohoku tsunami. What reduces mortality, however, is historical mortality. If you had a higher degree of mortality in previous tsunamis, fewer, significantly fewer, basically nobody died in the Tohoku tsunami. And if a prefecture did not have an experience with a tsunami mortality, then significantly more people died in the Tohoku tsunami. So the lesson here is do not believe in infrastructure investment. Uh, do not believe that infrastructures save your life. You may, of course, believe that infrastructure investment is a good public policy, and I completely agree with that. But what it does is it buys you time to flee, and you should flee. And you should flee whether you do have or you do not have an experience with previous tsunamis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, if you have questions, please, please keep it, keep your excitement, and then we would um, have half an hour at least for discussion. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> the, the education thing, I definitely want to talk about that, but we can talk later. Um, so we move on to the talk of uh, Jesus. Uh, he's a professor of economics at, here at WIU and also the um, director of economic analysis at the Wittgenstein Center, where, where I work as well. Um, but the most important information to know about Jesus is, uh, despite being an economist, he's a nice chap. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one thing <laughs> to know. Um, he has a reputation in, as you, many of you may know, in macroeconomics. So his talks will touch upon his expertise in that direction a bit on economic growth. But also, Jesus is also very strong um, econometrician. In fact, um, he plays an important role in my life, uh, which is solving any statistical problems I have. So up until now, you solve everything and then I think you will go on. So we, we, we collaborated a lot because I always have some issues that sociologists can't do. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, so um, and also Jesus has a broad research interest. So um, beyond the classic economic questions, so he has work on obviously topics like disaster research, climate change, migration, and conflict. Um, and as you would see in his talk, that he would nicely apply his skills in macroeconomics and also econometrics um, to, uh, to answer this. Again, this is quite a passing question also in disaster research, because one would think after the disaster strike, it must have destroyed um, the economy, livelihood, household, so income should go down like that. That's what a typical lay person like me would think. But probably empirically, um, in many places, the, the empirical data show the opposite. So that's a passing question, which I think you have some answers for that. So now the stage is yours. So I welcome Kisus here as well. Thanks a lot. Just a second, I have to prepare this stuff. There you go. And I'm going to be telling you something. I'm an economist, so I'm going to be telling you something about natural disasters and their economic effects, and in particular, their effects on economic activity. And with that, I mean the effects on economic growth. OK? Um, I'm, I'm basically, the, Raya already set the picture, right? I mean, it cannot be the fact that after experiencing the death of an amount of people, the destruction of physical capital, I mean, probably income per capita would go down after a disaster, right? I mean, that's something that everybody would expect to happen. And that is indeed what theory would tell you that should happen, at least if you go back to neoclassical standard theory, right? So the main idea of uh, the standard neoclassical setting when it comes to trying to understand what happens after a natural disaster, and for the moment, let's assume that that disaster does not kill anybody. It just destroys physical capital. It would not matter if it kills people, but just for the sake of being nice today, let's assume that it just destroys buildings and machinery. Um, so the, the, the standard story would be very simple. We economists are very simple when it comes to setting up models. That's why we are so successful at uh, trying to learn something out of reality. Uh, so the, the, the main idea would be the following. The whole economic activity that you see in a country that we would measure uh, through, the, through the gross domestic product of, of a country uh, is thought to be a function of the physical capital stock and the amount of labor that an economy has. And if an earthquake comes around and destroys your capital or kills its people, the people of that country, then obviously you're going to have a fall in income per capita. What standard neoclassical setting would tell you is that over time, if nothing else changes, just disaster hitting, then you would experience a convergence back to that growth path that you had before. So pretty much what you should expect visually is something of that sort. Okay, so you have GDP per capita in the y-axis, you have time in the x-axis, suddenly a disaster hits, you have a fall in GDP per capita, and then you converge back to the equilibrium. Okay, so you would have a loss of GDP per capita, and then in the long run, you would not observe any effects as compared to not having had that disaster. Okay, very nice. Uh, let's look at data, because, you know, that's a nice theory, but in the end, we are positivists, so we would like to have this confronted with data in order to falsify or eventually not be able to falsify that hypothesis. So, uh, two very important economists in the, in the field of, economic dis of, of natural disasters and economic growth, uh, Skidmore and Toya, had a look at those data back in the beginning of the 2000s. And they took data for 89 countries for the period 1960 to 1990. What you see in the y-axis is the growth rate of GDP per capita for that period. What you see in the x-axis is the total number of disasters that those countries experienced in the long run. So they went back to data going back to the 19th century to try to get a measure of something like the how disaster prone a country is, how, how likely it is that disasters experience, that, that countries experience some type of disaster. And what you saw was pretty weird, right? Because you have there like a 30 year growth rate, so it's kind of a long run growth rate, and you have a positive relationship between the amount of disasters that happen in a country and the per capita GDP growth that those countries uh, experience. Okay, and you would go like, yeah, but that's a trick, right? 
you have here the number of total disasters, and larger countries tend to have more disasters than smaller countries, just because they're larger. So it could be that it, this is just being mediated by the fact that you have differences in size across countries. Okay, no problem. I divide the number of disasters by the number of square kilometers that uh, the area of that country has. And what you observe is exactly the same. So it turns out that countries that experience more disasters tend to also, on average, without controlling for anything else, tend to also experience higher growth rates of GDP per capita. Okay, and that's weird. So we started to think about it. Uh, we are economists. <laughs> we started to think about it. Uh, and, and basically, we came up with three different explanations to this. Two of them are very sexy. One of them is not so sexy. Uh, number one of the sexy explanations. Well, it could be that after a disaster, you have the opportunity of, build up, of building up your country in ways that would be more productive than the way that your country was built up before. In particular, again, think about just physical capital that gets destroyed. So you have machinery, an earthquake comes and breaks the machinery, and you need to buy new machinery. Could be that the technological content of that new machinery is better than the one you had before. You have better vintage of, of physical capital, and that you are able to be more productive. You have per unit of capital, you have a higher productivity. That could be possible. That's explanation number one. I'll go to, the, to it in a second. Uh, explanation number two. It could be that if you live in a country that experiences disasters, that implies that the, the return on investing on a machine or on a building is more uncertain than in a country that doesn't experience disasters. Pretty clear, because a disaster could hit. So you have more uncertainty around the fact that whether your, your machine would still be alive in whatever. 10 years from now. So it could be that in countries that experience more disasters, it's the investment in what we call human capital, that is the investment in your own education, your own skills, that suddenly appears more attractive than the investment in physical capital, because physical capital can be blown away any moment. So it could be that the effect that makes you have a higher growth rate of income per capita is that you tend to have, on average, controlling for everything else, a more skilled labor force in those countries. Second explanation. I'll go to that in a second. Third explanation, that's the non-sexy one. Uh, it could be that it's just an accounting effect. It could be that GDP, you know, the stock of machinery that you have in a country, if it gets halved just because a disaster hit, that's not accounted in GDP, that's stock that you have. While GDP is a flow variable, it's about how much you are producing new, how much you are investing. So it could be that this is just the effect of reconstruction. Even if you don't reconstruct with new vintage capital, even if you just build up whatever, then you would have higher growth rates just due to accounting. Okay, so it could be that. So these are basically the three explanations that we have. And what we are going to do is we're going to try to check which one of them fits the data. Okay? So, first of all, let me, let me uh, bring it together. On average, countries that tend to experience more disasters also tend to have a higher growth rate of GDP per capita, which is weird and surprising. And, by the way, I showed you the relationship with historical um, uh, disaster data, so how prone a country is to having disasters historically. The same picture appears if you just have a look at contemporaneous disasters. Uh, actually, the effect is not negligible on average. Every additional natural disaster is related to a higher economic growth by 0.3 to 0.5 percentage points. It's quite, a, quite, quite something. And it tends to be very present in climatic disasters, storms, tropical storms, floods, and less so in geological disasters such as earthquakes. Okay? Great. So, as I told you, there are three explanations to that. These are the two that have some kind of economic background. It could be the fact that you have pretty much creative destruction in the Schumpeterian way. So, you are basically, the destruction that is being created by a disaster leads to an update of your capital stock. And that update of your capital stock update allows you to, to grow quicker. Or it could be that those countries that experience more natural disasters also tend to be more skilled in the sense of investing more on human capital instead of physical capital, because human capital, you take it with you, and you can move away with it. 
while your machinery is stuck somewhere where an earthquake or a flood could hit. Cool thing about these two hypotheses is that they are testable. Even cooler, I have tested them together with a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, co-authors. Uh, well, one of them alone, and the other one with a couple of other co-authors, and they got published, as you can see, quite, quite some time ago by now. So the first thing that we're going to have a look at is whether countries that experience natural disasters also tend to import, after a natural disaster, capital which is of higher technological content than the one that they used to have. Because if that's the case, then we have the explanation. Okay, here are the data. So what you have in the x-axis is, again, again this... Uh, this um, a measure of total disasters per square kilometer. So I'm again normalizing by area in order to have a look at basically comparable numbers across, uh, across countries. And what you have in the y-axis is a, a particular variable that we constructed for this paper, where what we had a look at is what is the content, the technological content of imports of a country after experiencing a disaster. So we went to the research and development expenditures of the countries that these, uh, these other economies that were hit by natural disasters were trading with, and we basically created an account of how much technology is embodied in the imports of, the, of those economies after a disaster. And as you can see, the story kind of goes through, right? So you have a positive relationship between experiencing more disasters or being more disaster prone and importing capital after a disaster that has a higher technological content. The only problem, as you can imagine, is that this is just basically driven by these countries. And that on top of that, this is just a correlation that you see if you don't take into account the fact that trade relationships across countries also depend on many other things different from the amount of disasters. So what we did is to bring this data into a proper econometric model and have a look at how a new disaster affected the amount of high technology capital that was being imported by these countries. And this relatively nice picture got much more complex once that you control for other potential aspects that can affect the amount of technology that you are being imported. In particular, the complexity is given by the fact that each country has got a different reaction, on average, to the existence of or the, the, the occurrence of a disaster when it comes to what they do afterwards in terms of importing physical capital. What you see in here is basically how, after a disaster, what is the effect on the import of high-technology goods. So if you have a positive effect, like those countries in here, that implies that natural disasters are indeed the source of what we call creative destruction, destruction that makes you then grow quicker afterwards. If you have a negative effect, those are, as you can see, most of the countries in our sample, that implies that actually the opposite is happening. You're reconstructing, but the effect is not necessarily better in terms of the productivity of the new capital that you are, that you are mounting in your country as compared to what you had before. So it turns out that actually, if there is creative destruction, it's just because of these countries. And those countries, as you can see, are ordered by GDP per capita. So basically, it's only the richest countries in our sample. These are kind of emerging markets. Uh, that are the ones that are benefiting of economic growth through creative destruction after a disaster hits. Most of the countries, and by that I mean most of the developing economies, are actually suffering from it by not being able to reconstruct uh, with, a, with a degree of technology that would be higher than the one that they had before. So actually, that story does not go through, at least it does not go through totally you need to have a, a given level of income per capita for you to be able to use a disaster to create creative destruction. Needless to say, GDP per capita is just a proxy variable for many other things that are around in a country in terms of institutions that would allow you to be able to reconstruct after a disaster in a way in which you could grow quicker. Um, as I told you, the other story was that it could be that 
countries that experience natural disasters just tend to invest differently than those that don't experience natural disasters when it comes to deciding whether to invest in machinery and physical capital as compared to human capital. Uh, that story is much more complex because human capital is also one of the driving factors of the adoption of technologies from abroad. So it can have kind of interactive effects that would lead to your country being more educated or having a higher level of skills, and that allowing you to grow more in general and also to be able to adopt technologies from abroad quicker. I had a look at it uh, in, my, in a paper that I published in the World Bank Economic Review within a, a project with the World Bank, and it turns out that the opposite happens. So on average, countries that have uh, a, a, a higher likelihood of having disasters tend to have lower enrollment rates in secondary school as compared to those countries that do not, or the same country not experiencing natural disasters. So it turns out that none of the two explanations at least can explain perfectly what is, what is happening in reality. The, the, the creative destruction story can only explain that for countries which are within a setting that would allow them to install technology from abroad, but not in general for all countries out there. And as I told you, and as Raya told you before, and as Thomas hinted at before, but found the opposite results, uh, human capital and education turns out to be also a big determinant of the damage caused by disasters. So what you have in here is a, a, a data set on the mean years of schooling and the death rate in uh, Nepalese communities after uh, a, a series of landslides and flood disasters. And what you can see is that those communities that had higher uh, mean years of education, that, were high, that had higher education, also tended to experience lower death rates. So this vulnerability to disasters tends to also go through human capital, as we heard before. And on top of that, disasters themselves have an effect on how much you accumulate, which basically takes us a little bit in a, in a circle. Uh, that implies that when we think about disasters, now we have moved away from this standard simplistic view about just accumulation of factors of production. That was where we started. And we have moved to a much more complex view of what natural disasters do to our economy. So you have the possibility of mixing the neoclassical view with the fact that countries could overshoot that, that uh, uh, growth path, for example, through foreign aid and through the investment in, te in, in technologies that would not be better, but that would imply a higher investment. That's this scenario. It could be the case that you don't update your capital, actually that you have worse capital afterwards. That's what we tend to see on average in developing economies, and that would be scenario C. Or it could be the fact that you indeed have something like creative destruction after a natural disaster. And basically, whether you are here, 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 or here, depends on average, on your income per capita, that means being richer, tends to allow you to grow more after a disaster. But by what we are measuring through being richer is also the fact that you tend to have in your economy institutions in place which are just more prone to allow you to grow better. And now comes the last plot twist. Those institutions, which tend to be very rooted in culture and in whatever political institutional settings, also depend on the likelihood of disasters. So in a series of, of papers over the last years, we have discovered, or in this case not me, but economists and, and other social scientists have discovered that very deeply rooted institutional settings in economies also tend to correlate <laughs> with the occurrence of disasters. The typical example is social trust. So the, the answer to the question, do you tend to trust other people in your surroundings, which appears very often in the World Value Survey and in other surveys about, about um, um, whatever social trust and institutional settings, tends to be, the, the answer to that question tends to be very well explained also by how often 
that country tends to be hit by disasters and actually tends to work in a positive way. So countries that experience more disasters tend on average to have a higher level of societal trust. There's a super interesting paper that got published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Development Studies where Fleming and his co-authors went to Chile after that earthquake that Thomas was telling us about and played a social trust game with different communities, some of them having been hit by that, that uh, humongous earthquake and some of us not having been hit by it. The, 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 the trust game is very, very simple. They divided people into two groups and they gave an amount of money to one of those groups that they were allowed to distribute between themselves and people from the other group without knowing who the other people were that would receive that money. Those that received the money from the other group received not that money, but three times that money. So there was kind of an incentive to being altruistic. On the other hand, out of those three times that money, you could send back to the person who sent it to you as much as you wanted. Okay? Now, by, doing, by having a look at that experiment, you can measure on the one hand how much trust you have. That's kind of the first sender has got to have trust that the other person is going to send something back. So out of the, out of the amount of, of, uh, of money that people were sending, you could get a measure of how much how much trust you had in that society, and by measuring how much is being sent back relative to how much you got, you can also measure something like how much reciprocity you tend to observe in that society. The results of that experiment were that those communities that had been hit by the earthquake tended not to be different in terms of trust, but to be significantly different in terms of reciprocity. And in that case, actually to have a higher level of reciprocity, which also can explain can, or can be explained through actually the experience of, uh, of uh, the aftermath of a disaster. So that implies that even the cause or even the mediator of the effects of disasters on economic growth on itself also may depend and may depend pretty, pretty importantly on the occurrence of such disasters themselves, which implies basically that we have quite a lot of work to do, not only as economists, but also political scientists such as Thomas, or sociologists that need econometricians such as Raya. And that was it. Thank you very much. Is that sitting order? I think Raya sits in the bin. Yeah. Um, I guess there are microphones around as well. So let's see. Um, we have about half an hour for questions. So I would like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself, your name, maybe your um, affiliation. And if you want to say your discipline, are you a nice economist or not nice? That's that's good to know as well. So, yes, um, I think I would like to open the, the floor to, to the audience. Um, any? I'm sure you would like to discuss, ask, or comment, or share with us your research. I have to break the ice. I have to break the ice. Oh, right. Um, actually, no, I, I like to, 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 to stop with this slide because there's a room for research. You might notice, actually, that we the, the two work um, has been done at the aggregated level. Also, Thomas' work, it's more um, prefecture level, but it's still, we're looking at the differences. We, and Jesus' work, it's, we run the cost countries analysis and so on, which is, which is great, which is sexy when you want to sell the result because it's big. We have the results for the whole world and so on. But, but the two talks already, you might have already picked up, it's quite complex. Um, um, issues behind, right? Because the decision that people make, we, we make a speculation that people probably decide to flee or not to flee, for example. So I guess the room for research is also to look at this type of questions at different levels. So we need individual level type of research, probably household level as well, because obviously the decision to prepare for disaster, for example, to invest, it's also um, it probably depends who the head of household is. So women tend to be more um, risk averse, 
more prepared, more caring about the families more than men, for example. Sometimes we know that women tend to spend money better in terms of protecting the household and so on. So, you know, this, this type of, 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 of question that can be done. So if those of you are still looking for um, research topics for your master thesis or PhD, we are here. <laughs> so I would like to welcome you to contact us as well. Um, still it's not... <laughs> well, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, um, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Maximilian. I'm a becoming macroeconomist, so I'm working at the Department of Economics here at the VU. And I have a uh, question, comment to this unsexy explanation for, um, you've mentioned so this um, stock flow story. So what, what the authors did is taking an average over 30 years and what they're ignoring is the time variation within these 30 years. So it would be interesting, or is the research um, concerning looking at exactly the point where the disaster happens? So the, like treating it as a turning point and then looking, is there afterwards, after a natural disaster hits a country, um, high economic growth? So it would be possibly interesting to look into this issue on a more disaggregated spatial level. Um, but I guess then you could really prove one of those hypotheses uh, you've, you've shown in the, one of the last slides, whether scenario A, B, or C, or D is possibly wrong or, or true. Should I answer directly? Or? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yes, um, you're completely right. Actually, the, 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 the Skidmore and Toya evidence that I showed has got the problem that what you are comparing is the variation that you observe across countries for a relatively long period of time. So there could be other factors affecting economic growth. And it also could be the case that you would only be able to identify this accounting effect if you have a look at basically what happens right after the disaster in terms of reconstruction. Because as I said, well, the, the loss in stock of capital does not count to GDP, and therefore it does not count to income. While whatever you create on top of it in terms of investing, it's going to be accounted for it. Needless to say, that was not very convincing in terms of being able to identify that those effects were just pure disaster effects. Uh, afterwards, and including my own work, what we did is to exploit not only the variation across countries, but also the variation over time. So you are able to identify what are the effects of economic growth on economic growth, and in particular on this adoption of new technology, if we want to believe that it's the reconstruction efforts that create these creative destruction effects. Um, we did that in the form of a panel regression. So we were able to identify what happens two years, three years, one year, five years after the disaster. The effects that I told you about before in terms of the reconstruction efforts that come up uh, after a disaster in terms of the technological content that they have, they come from a panel regression where we are trying to really have a look at whether the reconstruction efforts lead to higher economic growth through technology upgrading. And what you saw is that that, that is on itself complex enough as for you to find heterogeneity across countries. So you have countries that indeed have this type of creative destruction effects, those were the guys on the right, and you have those where the opposite takes place. So the, the research uh, agenda, the research frontier does not do any more this type of cross-country uh, uh, variation-based inference. They really have a look at what happens right after a disaster. But I have to frame it somehow in, the, in existing cool uh, scatter plots. And with panel data, things get very complicated. Um, yeah, my name is Valentin Seidler, and um, I'm a lovely economist, I think. And, and before I became a lovely economist, I was actually a disaster preparedness guy with the Red Cross. So I've been in several earthquakes, actually, and I, I'm an earthquake manager, if you want to say so. 
So I think I have a really sexy idea how you guys should do a paper together. And I think it's, it's such a good idea. I should even tell you. I should write it myself, probably. But it's a really good idea. Oh, or, we can talk about it later. No, but this is really good. Think about it. So what I think is that people actually build strong institutions by going through a series of disasters because they need to cooperate to get over this and to by repeated action and this kind of stuff. So, but to the mediating factor in there is your human capital. You need a specific level of human capital to start with to be, overcome the collective action problem that you will have to benefit from a series of disasters like Japan has done, for example. So in places where I've been with the Red Cross and people have a very low human capital, and I'll talk about this in a second, then a, the repeated effect of disasters does not create uh, strong institutions and it does not lead to the, to the uh, it's on the lower tail of your, of your many graphs, right? But if you go to a country like Italy, I've been in Italy, for example, and they, in the Aquila and the big earthquake, these people have enough strong institutions and enough human capital available to benefit from this stuff and to rebuild, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, well, the, yes, they do. And, and I think that's very important. And then one more thing to human capital, it is, I think when we talk human capital, we, I think you gave years of school or measures of the standard stuff that we get. I think we should be more specific about when we talk about the collective action problem, the guys who are coordinating these are actually bureaucrats, which is a bit part of my own research. But we need bureaucrats to lower our collective action costs. So we need to look at the human capital of those bureaucrats who organize the response or the preparedness to a recurrent disaster. And that's exactly what, what Japan is so good at, right? So they have these excellent bureaucrats and they have one type of disaster that comes all the time, which is earthquakes combined with floods and, and tsunamis. So they're really, really good at managing this. And um, the Austrians, for example, are really good at managing floods. So when we get these super floods, we have all the boys, each village has their volunteer guys and they have the sandbags and the aluminum walls and we can even like divert the half the Danube River and, and there will be zero casualties because we train this every year and we have super cool bureaucrats and money into this. And after each big flooding in Austria, our GDP jumps by whatever, half a percent, as you know better than me. So I think that's, that's where you, you both come together. I hope I did make myself a bit clear, but I'm interested in your answer. Well, let me first say that we come together fairly often for different occasions. Uh, we not always discuss papers that we could collaborate on, but it's very obvious that we could work together on, on, on disaster research. It's a little scarcity in data, especially when we want to overcome uh, this, this problem of, of macro data. Uh, so it would be great, actually, if I were to get back to the education issue. Uh, in, in, in the paper that I presented here, the education effect was positive, so in the pre if a prefecture has better education, the number of death in that prefecture was higher, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the better educated people were more likely to die than the less educated people. That's a problem known as ecological fallacy in, in methodology. So it's a very standard problem that one cannot make inferences, not easily and not reliably from macro data to, to micro data. When it comes to uh, social in <laughs> institutions, we again have uh, relatively, on, and, and trust and, 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 and um, bureaucrats that uh, help people to overcome collective action problems during and after the disaster. Um, then of course, we again have relatively good macro data, but we again don't usually use micro data on, on, on this. So there, is, there are questions that one can address using this macro data of, of social trust, and one is the one that you pointed out and that Jesus pointed out here in the presentation and that I found utterly convincing, that is that you need to have a, <coughs> a combination of um, pre-existing capital that may or may not survive the disaster and also a good capital stock in social um, um, and capital that will survive the disaster unless of course everybody dies which hasn't happened yet in natural disasters. And that's a prerequisite of being relatively quick in overcoming the 
consequences of a natural disaster. So in my life, I haven't really studied the long-term consequences of natural disasters. Everything I have done were about the immediate consequences uh, for either mortality rates or economic damage. Um, but it's very clear that the long-term consequences of natural disasters can be very different from the short-term con consequences of natural disasters. And I'm sure that is at least partly uh, due to the variables that you identified for us and that have been addressed by Jesus too in the presentation. Let, let me complicate your problem a bit further uh, because the, the, the pieces that you bring together are indeed coherent, right? So you do have the human capital effects, you do, do have the social capital effects, and you're right to, to think that uh, uh, bureaucracy is one of the fundamentals of social capital in a given country, and in the case of disasters, it may, may play a very important role. Um, however, sometimes social capital works in mysterious ways. Uh, there's quite a lot of evidence uh, after the Kobe uh, earthquake in, in 1995 in, in Japan that actually uh, much of the post-disaster aid worked perfectly thanks to the work of the Japanese mafia. So sometimes social nets go way beyond what you would expect as official type of social networks. And um, if, if you're starting to then have a look at things which are very difficult to measure, such as the importance of more informal type of networks, I guess the mafia is informal enough as for it not to be captured in official statistics, uh, <laughs> Uh, then things get very complicated, and that's the beauty also of the of the of the research question in here, right? That it's um, it, it the the observational data you have is the result of interactions that happen at so many different levels. That probably I agree with you that the bureaucracy story is an important one, but I think that the social capital story that goes together also with very soft. Uh, phenomena such as social trust is even more complex than just looking at, at bureaucrats. I mean, Jesus has, has, has some doubt about bureaucracy, but in fact, we just had a paper that looked at how governance, in fact, affects ad adapt climate change adaptation. So it's, it just adds to another complexity, but you did touch upon um, many things that we, we have looked at because you also look at how um, education actually um, drive democracy, democratic movement. And then um, from that, then we have a series of papers that look at how human capital might reduce vulnerability. So, so there's, there's, there's a lot of, of link there. Um, one thing that I think Thomas wants me to really talk about, the, your effect of education, right, on tsunami mortality. Um, maybe I ask back the audience as well. Um, of the 18,000 or so dates from the Tohoku tsunami in 2011, um, do you think, if you think about population composition, so who were more likely to die in that um, tsunami in terms of maybe gender and age? The older, yeah, yeah. Older people, precisely, and yeah. Um, yeah, I also wanted to address a question um, sure. earlier, and, and I put, possible theory would be that people of working age and of higher education would be more likely to die because it happened in the early afternoon and the more important you feel your work is the more likely you are to not leave your workplace even though there is a well, because you know, they it, are Japanese, so they're not going to leave your work. Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I made that comments again. <laughs> so. I, I was thinking about this too, although I would not think that corroborates my, my theory so much as, you know, if you have a, an agricultural uh, prefecture, um, the opportunity cost is much lower than if you work in a nuclear power plant and um, leaving your workplace means you have to shut down everything first. Uh, so that would be one possible explanation. And, and since I have the microphone already, a question would be also to, um, to uh, well, what is the best policy response now that we, we kind of know that the experience without mortality, 
or without mortality in, in one's vicinity of a natural disaster decreases the chance that uh, decreases the chance that you're fleeing and thus increases the chance that you're dying from the from from a um, disaster, what is the best response? Uh, what should a government tell its people? Because obviously there must also be a cost of panic. Um, so telling everyone to flee, uh, uh, which is what Thomas kind of did in, in the end of the presentation, would also probably not be the ideal solution. Want to answer the policy questions? <laughs> Well, Adrian, thanks for the question. Um, yes, we, I, we already thought about um, your, I think, very convincing idea that um, that education is correlated with workspace activities and the disaster took place on a working day in the early afternoon and those people were Japanese and therefore they would stay in the factory or whatever there was there. As I said before, it would be great to have microdata, that's, which is, to my very best knowledge, I might be wrong, um, not available. <laughs> in terms of <laughs> policy advice, um, so the optimal world, of course, is one that we can get very, it's very difficult to get close to the optimal world, but the optimal world would be one in which the early warning system worked perfectly. If we knew, uh, if we had an early warning system that would give us in virtually no time the a pretty precise estimate of the tsunami wave height and the run-up height, which is difficult to estimate, uh, then we could directly tell which people ought to flee or not to flee, given that we know how high the tsunami wall is. So it's a combination of an imperfect early warning system and a, a relatively low um, tsunami wall in Japan that co triggered the, the variance of the death rates through the different prefectures. The, the Japanese have made a very straight, Jap Japanese government has made a very straight decision on uh, the Japanese East Coast. They now construct a new seawall, which is 15 meters high. And yes, that would have just about saved the majority of these 18,500 people that were killed in the Tohoku tsunami. But eventually, there will be an earthquake, which is a little bit stronger, a little bit closer to the coastline, and it will produce a run-up high, which is higher than those 15-meter tsunami wall. So whatever you will do in terms of infrastructural investment, it's very likely to be imperfect given uh, the, what the nature can throw at you. So for another example is that the Dutch, which is probably the, after Bangladesh, the second most endangered country in terms of uh, the probability of major inundations. They uh, invested billions and billions into uh, the, the most sophisticated dike system in, in the world. But this system is said to, uh, to pr produce safety for between 97 and 99% of all storm floods, not 100%, and I think 100% is not possible. So the infrastructure will always be imperfect, and therefore, if you want, uh, you don't want uh, a large number of false alarms relative to correct alarms, you need to improve the early warning systems. And in the case of the Tohoku tsunami, you need to largely improve your language. You cannot just call the Tohoku tsunami a, a major tsunami is coming up. That's just not serious enough. You have to make it sound much more dangerous and stronger if that's what you expected. But there was another issue with the JMA uh, forecast of the uh, tsunami uh, wave height and the run-up heights, and that is that the GMA actually had assumed 
that an earthquake of that magnitude is not possible, and therefore they would not predict a higher tsunami wave and, and a higher run-up. So it's, you need to improve uh, the early warning systems if you want to prevent uh, false alarms. And as I said on my last slide, all infrastructure measures by you safety from relatively minor events, but f for major events, they just buy you time. So it's better to run twice than to drown once. Maybe I, I like to. Where social scientists put the blame on natural scientists for something. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I, I like to add actually a bit here. Um, I think you can think of three things, right? Uh, reflecting what Thomas was saying. Um, the, so more on the infrastructure side. So you have the warning system has to be in place. And in fact, we have learned if you look at the trends over time, um, the death, mortality from natural disasters actually have been declining because we learned from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, many people haven't heard of tsunami before and we learned from that. We learned from all the big typhoon and so on because the next typhoon that hit the Philippines after the 2013, there was much less um, number of dead, for example. So that has to be in place. Infrastructure, it's, um, as you said, it can work, but, but Actually, the Netherlands probably or Japan is probably the only two or three countries in the world that can do it. The U.S. has much longer coastline. They probably need seawalls, but even the U.S. cannot afford to build a dike or seawalls, right? So I guess we, it has to be the combination, of what we would call soft adaptation strategies, such as human capital, maybe such as good governance. Obviously, that's the case as well. Yeah. Um, we have about five minutes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, good evening. I'm Lorenzo, I study uh, marketing here, and I'm from Italy, where we're kind of used to everything, I would say. Not that good in preventing, but sometimes very good at the management post-disaster, sometimes not very good. Um, my question is, from my experience, I've always seen disasters to a, let's say, a regional scale, or maybe a city, thinking about Venice in the last month, since I'm also from the area of Venice. Um, and I want to ask Mr. Crespo, uh, what's the magnitude of disaster that you have considered in your research? So what's the, what is the definition of disaster in your research? Because if I thought, I mean, Venice is a disaster as well, but I, I cannot think that it can affect the GDP of a whole country, you know? So that is my question. Oh, that's a, I, I love measurement questions. Um, it's a, um, <laughs> There's a very standard comparable way of, of measuring disasters or, or of defining disasters all through the, the econometric literature. And basically three things have to be in place. At least 10 people have to die, which basically implies that usually the Venice flats are not disasters, are not in the data set. At least 100 people need to be affected or homeless out of it. And a state of emergency has to be put out, has to be called out. So we are talking about things which... Uh, which are serious, let's say it like that. The problem is that, of course, the definition of a disaster is also endogenous to the vulnerability of that disaster. The same disaster hitting in two different countries may kill 10 people, affect 100 and, and whatsoever. So uh, as much as we can, we would go to purely physical uh, characteristics of those disasters. That's basically the, the, the way that Thomas uh, took in his presentation by being very precise about, okay, where was the epicenter and what are the, 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 the effects at a given point in time. However, when it comes to doing cross-country comparisons over very, very long periods of time, we need to decide on something. And so you can imagine each one of these papers has got very long appendix where you change the definition of a disaster and see basically what plays a role. Also the nature of a disaster, this difference between climatic and geological disasters that plays a very, very important role, even at the aggregate level. So uh, getting back to the very, very first comment, uh, probably going much more micro in terms of understanding what's going on for a given disaster that you understand properly, also in terms of the physicality of it, would be a, 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 the, the avenue of research that would pay the most. You are trading that off 
in terms of comparability when you go aggregate and you need to just call something a disaster. Do we have one more question? So, hello. You hear me? Um, yes. Yes, I'm fortunate enough to be one of Thomas's students. Um, my my question goes back to the um, the end of your talk and the observation that essentially in in Japan. Um, the people, lots of people decided not to flee um, and were obviously tragically killed, putting their faith in this technology, the early warning system, the, the, the walls that, that didn't hold. So they had a, what turned out to be quite a misplaced trust in the technologies built to protect them. Um, and again, you, you mentioned that effect of education and that that was more prevalent around more educated people you know, these kind of foolish, edu uh, more intelligent or more educated at least people. So my question is, and he'll probably, you'll probably kill me for asking this question, but would you apply those same learnings of that we should be careful about having too much faith in technology in the face of climate change, which could be argued to be a very large disaster? I was waiting for this question and this word. Um, I already <laughs> suggested that uh, Raya is answering everything related to climate change, so I'm not supposed to give you an answer here. Um, let me stress one, um, one major difference between a tsunami and sea level rise. One is very quick. It took like 30 to 45, 50 minutes from the earthquake to the tsunami wave reaching the, sh the shore. And the other process, sea level rise, is uh, really slow. So in my belief on what the world will throw at us, it's, it's extremely unlikely that anybody will uh, die from sea level rise because it's just too slow. However, what, what could happen, of course, is combination of storm floods and sea level rise and storm and sea level rise could make storm floods um, more dangerous. Wind, more storms could make floods higher and so on and so on. So these are possibilities at the moment, um, realistic possibilities, but possibilities. Um, and so what do I think about infrastructure investment? So there was an article yesterday in German newspapers about uh, whether sea level rise and perhaps more wind in the North Sea will uh, make German dikes and dams vulnerable. And I think the answer is probably yes. So that Germany and the Netherlands are both likely to increase the height of the um, the dikes, they, however, do not have to do it tomorrow. They have a few years to, perhaps even a few decades to do this. So at the at the moment, we do not observe a significant increase in flood levels on the North North Sea shores, but times are a changing. And I will not kill you for the question. And I would also point out that we have a reception over there and there, and there is something to drink and perhaps also something to eat, I don't know. And it's in the neighboring room, I guess. And you're all invited to come. And you have the last word. Oh, no. Okay, oh, no, that's okay. okay. So have the, have the, the last word. He's, he, he's German, obviously, so let's, let's not go over the time. Oh, I said that again. <laughs> Since I did it again, so uh, but I, I I can see the interest in this research, and I think you two have opened up a lot of interesting questions. And thank the, so much the audience actually, and obviously we for for hosting this event. Uh, we matters for sure, and thank you, Thomas and Kisus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raya.